to the final session, sorry, the final session of the Vermont Literacy Leadership Series. For those of you attending for the first time, I am Brenda Warren, president of the Reading League Vermont. I'm excited to see all of you here. I know you will learn a lot today. If you missed the two presentations last week, you will definitely want to check out the recordings. They are both packed full of great information. The recordings will be available on our website. For those attending for the first time, I want to tell you a little bit about the Reading League Vermont and some upcoming events. We are a state chapter of the Reading League National. There are currently 33 and counting state chapters that are all working to advance the awareness, understanding, and use of evidence-aligned reading instruction in their respective states. As part of the Reading League, we believe all children deserve to learn to read and all teachers can learn to teach them. I want to also let you know about some exciting upcoming events. You will receive an email later that includes uh, these details. Please mark your calendars and spread the word about our upcoming Literacy Lounge in October. The registration, it'll be on Saturdays um, and the registration information will be sent to our subscribers via email and posted on our Facebook page and our website. This will be a monthly informal networking opportunity for educators to discuss their questions and concerns about teaching reading. It will be facilitated by Abby Roy. And don't forget to subscribe at no cost to the Reading League Vermont. As a subscriber, you will receive emails about upcoming events and opportunities, both in Vermont and nationally. Plus, you will see, receive the brand new Teaching Reading and Brief newsletters. These twice weekly newsletters will provide valuable information, sorry, that should be twice monthly newsletters, will provide valuable information about topics related to teaching structured literacy with suggestions for instruction, assessment, targeting specific skills, and adapting instruction when students fail to make progress. And lastly, for those who live near Montpelier, we will have a table at the third annual Community Health Education Fair on the state lawn from 11, on Saturday, October, August 24th, from 11 to three. If you're in the neighborhood that day, we'd love to meet you in person. So feel free to stop by. Now let's get to today's presentation. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that the chat will be open beginning at 1040 for you to submit your questions for Dr. Souza. Now let me introduce our speaker, Sheila Souza. Dr. Souza has been the superintendent at Addison Northwest School District since July of 2018. She is a native of Randolph, Vermont and is a 30 year career educator. She was the director of curriculum in the Har Harwood Unified Union School District prior to coming to Addison Northwest. Dr. Sewell is currently co-president of the Champlain Valley Superintendents Association. I am looking forward to hearing Dr. Sousa's presentation, making it work from a superintendent's perspective. And now I'll turn it over to you, Sheila. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, again, I am Sheila Soul. I'm here today actually with members of my team. Um, and I think that's really important because the work we've done here in Addison Northwest um, is largely because of them. And I want to be sure that they receive the credit and are able to speak from their perspective as well. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and get started again. Um, I'm Sheila Soule. Um, I am the superintendent here in Addison Northwest. I've been here since 2018 and co-presenting with me today will be Kara Griswold. Um, Kara was the director of student support services here in the district from 2013 until uh, last year. We miss her very much. Um, Kara, I don't know if you want to say hi. Yes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to sharing all the work that we've done to move literacy forward in our district. Great. So um, here's a bit of an outline of what we'll talk about here today. We'll give a little bit of an introduction. That's this. Um, and then we'll talk about um, the beginning of our work in the district, our PD plan, uh, the supports that we offered, and um, some other uh, considerations before we talk about our key learnings and some takeaway 
So um, our district transitioned to a structured literacy approach to provide a research-based approach to support students with diverse learning needs. Um, this shift helped to ensure that all students would receive systematic and explicit instruction in reading, writing, and language skills. Um, and as we know, we're all here on the call, structured literacy has been shown to be effective in improving literacy outcomes for all students, including those um, who struggle with reading. And I think that that is a really important statement because um, it's not just for those who struggle in reading. I think it's really important to remember that um, it's a shaky foundation um, for all students to not have this foundation. A lot of our kids come into school, they already read, um, but they may struggle later on um, without this explicit instruction um, to expand their skills once the comprehension gets more difficult and other things. So this explicit instruction is for all learners, not just those who may struggle with reading. Um, so looking ahead, um, I want to talk a little bit about the why, um, why we did this work. Um, and before we start this, I think it's really important um, to talk about my own experience with systems work um, and literacy coming into this position in 2018, because I do think it's relevant and helps to explain the sustained commitment we've made here in Addison Northwest. Um, as Brenda mentioned, I'm 32 years in public education. I spent the majority of my career working as a director of curriculum. I actually have an elementary mathematics background. I'm not a literacy expert. Um, Ten of those years as director of curriculum was in the Harwood Unified Union School District, um, which is also where I started my teaching career. So I spent a lot of years there. Um, Harwood is a, a large school district, geographically speaking, um, and especially in a pre-Act 46 environment. Um, we really lacked a systems approach to literacy instruction um, with individual schools in the district adopting sort of preferred practices uh, with some overlap. Um, over time, in my time there, we were able to put into place some common assessments, which were largely based in a balanced liter literacy approach. Um, but also during this time, I had the good fortune to work with Donna Reed Dawson, who many of you probably know as the Director of Student Support Services there. And she recognized that our um, performance gaps in our local and state level assessments were really representative of a need for explicit instruction. And um, we were trying to make the move to integrate um, more broadly a structured literacy approach there um, as I was leaving, which was predictably, I think I could say predictably, um, met with some resistance. So in coming to Addison Northwest, um, Kara, I recognized that Kara and her team had already done some of that heavy lifting, so to speak. Um, to move the needle forward um, on a universal approach to structured literacy instruction. Um, so I really saw my job as a superintendent um, to clear the path and support Kara and the other administrators in imp implementing this comprehensive PD plan, which we'll talk more about um, so again, I said it to Brenda sort of more laughingly, but I, I think my job was to get out of the way and make sure the work could happen. Um, so kind of the beginning, the why, um, Carol will speak a little bit about this, but I always ask like so, sort of like for, um, what, for what was the problem for which this was the solution? Why? Why are we moving in this direction? And um, this data that's referenced here on the slide um, is a representative sample of what we were seeing at, at grade level. So free and reduced lunch students were 66% below uh, proficiency. Non-free and reduced lunch were 50% um, below proficiency in reading, state level reading assessment. Um, and um, we saw boys as compared to girls performing um, more poorly. So, um, I think the identified um, issue, the problem, was the lack of a consistent scope and sequence and um, no real common resources um, or, or programs in use across the districts. I think, I think there was some um, foundations in use um, and some um, local assessments that were being used, but not really a district-wide approach to this. So 
Uh, that was kind of the state of the state at the time. And then I'll let Kara kind of speak to where we went next. Yeah, so I attended a training um, in the middle of the state somewhere. I um, can't remember the location. It was like a large barn. And Michaela uh, Martin and Andrea Watson were presenting the work that um, Williamstown area had done around moving the needle um, to change their literacy results. And sitting there listening to that, I was like, oh my goodness, like our profiles are very similar. Like we could be doing the same thing. Um, and I was fortunate that the special ed staff that I had been working with the last few years had already jumped on the bandwagon of structured literacy and had already taken courses through the CERN Center using the OG approach and were really seeing phenomenal results with students with differing abilities um, and really changing their outcomes. Um, so I brought the information back to the team um, and the current um, director of curriculum at that time, the current superintendent at that time, and the principals um, all really thought it was a great idea. So we worked with Stern to map out an approach for over five years on how we could train all of our K through four, K through six um, staff and all of the special ed staff pre-K through 12 um, to implement structured literacy approaches across the, the district. So it would be a unified front to really change our reading outcomes for students. Um, and my personal background was teaching special ed. Um, so kind of a passionate piece there. And so this was largely our, our plan um, and uh, started in the 2019-2020 school year. Of course, we did not realize that COVID was also going to happen during the 2019-2020 school year. Um, but nevertheless, we persisted um, in our effort. Um, and in the first, in the beginning, we worked to train our K through second grade teachers um, using our early release days um, and other time. Um, we also trained our central office directors at that time. And then in the next year, we expanded that, uh, again, working with Stern on all of our professional development days um, to train third through sixth grade teachers and um, started some real intensive um, principal support at that time. So all of our teachers took um, the took Orton Gillingham for classroom educators. Um, we also targeted some key support staff who would be, you know, responsible for supporting literacy instruction day in and day out. Um, and then using our um, literacy coaches in the district. Um, we started to lay out some expectations around lessons and, you know, the scope and sequence. Um, and those outlines were, were shared. And then, you know, teachers were supported in um, being accountable to those plans. Um, throughout this time, teachers received ongoing support from the Stern Center, as well as from our local professional development literacy um, coaches. We have very limited, a very limited coaching model in place. We have very limited resources um, in terms of liter literacy intervention and coaching, but we do have a little bit and we were, we were careful to make sure to direct every ounce of that. Uh, towards supporting teachers and doing this, you know, hard work. Um, and over time, um, we've continued to add to that bank of resources. Um, and we are continually, um, continually updating those and, and putting those out. So um, over time, I feel like we've just, you know, gotten uh, better at, at what this support can look like. And we're now going into our, you know, fifth year um, with, with doing this work. So, you know, thinking about teachers and thinking about what a major transition this is for them, um, you know, many teachers have not um, had any professional development that looks like this in any of their teacher training. And it takes an incredible amount of, of time for them to, to consider what that instruction needs to look like. Um, and so we want to make sure that we provide that time to them by making sure they have common planning time, common MTSS team time, 
Um, and we also set an expectation for the amount of instructional time um, that they'll be providing toward literacy. So we aim to have a mandatory 90 minute lip block that's uninterrupted by other things um, day in and day out. So time is a huge piece of the success of this initiative. Um, we also wanted to bake in some incentives for teachers. This is a lot of work. Um, teachers did have the option to use the professional development money um, to take this course for, um, for credit, which allows them to move on the salary scale, um, which is an incentive. And as I already mentioned, through teamwork, um, we provided that time for teams, teacher teams, grade level teams, um, to be able to work with their peers and the coach the coaches to co-construct lessons and look at data within our MTSS structure. Um, I don't know, Kara, if you have anything you want to add about um, what that teacher support looked like. Um, I think the also the key piece too is if you can't come to work at Addison Northwest, um, it was kind of known that you were going to take the training to become a structured literacy teacher. So it was kind of built into the onboarding process, I think, which is really important for folks to know. Um, and and the, the ways that we did that, we worked with folks around when it was offered. We also had to think about support for our administrators who, you know, like myself, maybe have not come up as a literacy expert over the years. We have, um, you know, our, our principals have done all kinds of work, um, um, but none of our elementary principals have, were elementary school teachers. So um, what does that, you know, need to look like from their perspective? Um, and we made time for them with coaching and support through Stern to do walkthroughs and think about that sort of systems implementation and what that would look like. So there's always time um, provided for um, our school leaders um, to work with um, experts in terms of what the instructional elements need to look like. We also, um, through our administrative teamwork, uh, each principal set a literacy related professional goal. And then we allocated time throughout the year to um, work on those goals collaboratively, talk about where we were in the, in the goals work and what our next steps were. So really just being intentional about what we were trying to achieve. Um, and then I think Kara's already alluded to some other, you know, other considerations. It's not enough to just kind of do this in five years time because you've got to think about how to sustain this uh, priority. Um, over time, we have had 65% of our elementary teachers are uh, are new at the elementary level. That's a, a lot of turnover. So we've had to think about, you know, how do we kind of, you know, make sure that they are getting um, the same training and the same level of support that their peers had over time. Um, so that um, plan for turnover really needs to be um, intentional. And then, you um, the coaching is intentional. They can't just learn it. They've got to have that support in transferring it into their instruction. Um, so coaching is really key. And then, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have, I don't know if I can get here. Yeah, we have um, continued to develop a resource library. Um, our coaches do a ton of work on this and keep it up to date. Um, and this is a, a go-to resource guide um, with scope and sque sequence and lesson expectations and so forth um, that's in our district for teachers to use. So um, that's become a very critical um, resource for our staff as well. Um, let's see. Um, thinking about our results and our key learning and, and sort of our takeaway. Um, you know, it's, it, this isn't something that you do and then see instant results in your state level data. Um, let's see if I can get to that first. We're not seeing results in our state level data, um, not yet. Um, and that's okay because it kind of goes back to my point of what we are trying to accomplish is to build a really strong foundation from which to build. Um, and I do think that over time we'll see more transfer and more 
of a relationship between this work and our state level data. But as you know, I mean, uh, the SVAC um, or the VTCAP is, is testing, you know, sort of different things than that direct Orton Gillingham um, instruction is providing. So it will take time to see this showing up um, in our data. We have seen positive outcomes in our intervention. This is some um, look at our local assessment data in fall and in spring over the course of one year. And you can see that the blue line is our students who are receiving support through our MTSS um, structure and the green is all students. So you're seeing that achievement gap and the trajectory of that achievement gap beginning to close. Um, so that's really promising. But I think the work that ex the, the data point that excites me the most is in looking at the referrals for a specific learning disability in literacy. Um, I think this is the beginning of a trend. I'm hopeful that it's the beginning beginning of a trend. Um, but um, you can see that in 2019. 22% of our referrals were for um, SLD and literacy. And last year that was down to 9%. Um, so that feels really significant to me. Um, if this means that fewer students are being identified um, as having a disability in literacy, I think we're doing the right work. Um, Kara, do you wanna say anything else about the data or about those referrals? No, I think it, your point is very well taken that it's it's really reducing the numbers at the earlier levels. And as we all know from reading the research, um, kids can be misidentified as a learning disability in one of the basic skill areas of reading if they aren't taught um, appropriate reading skills. So I think we're just seeing how their needs are getting met at the universal level. So they're not then not being referred for special education services, which is great. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I would invite, um, we have a couple of other folks on the call. Um, this has really been a team effort. And I think one of our elementary principals, Matt DeBloy is on the line. I think also our director of learning, Gabe Hamilton is on the line. So I might invite them to come off mute and add anything from their perspective that's relevant to our work here. Do you want me to go first, Gabe? I'm going to go first. Go ahead, <laughs> uh, so I think uh, I think over the time that we've been involved in this uh, move from um, kind of a patchwork approach to a structured literacy approach, we've been consistent with soliciting feedback from our educators and finding out what are the pieces and parts uh, that will facilitate them being more uh, effective users of data, more effective users of resources, uh, ensuring that we have um, the right resources in, in the building for them, and also ensuring that we don't have the wrong resources for them. So like, you won't find an F&P kit here, uh, but you did at the beginning of this process. So trying to um, support teachers, um, work with the Stern Center. I mean, we've done... Um, I've been here through this whole process and, and we have a great working relationship with the Stern Center, working with Peggy and Amy. They come in uh, regularly to work with our teachers. We're able to um, sit in and do co-observations with them as a function of like a regular supervision and evaluation process. Uh, that's been super helpful for both um, uh, myself uh, as an administrator. Um, I have a background in language and literature, but it's in a second language. So it's it's a little bit different, um, but there there is uh, some similarity. I think uh, Kara alluded to deliberate hiring practices, which is for sure a thing. Uh, we we discuss structured literacy in the interview process um, so that it's not uh, a surprise. Um, and we've done a lot of work in teaming um, at the uh, the grade level as well as the district level to help uh, teachers work more effectively together, both across across the buildings as well. Um, and it's, and it's been a sustained effort and it hasn't been a secret. So everyone who works at the elementary level in our district knows about this. Um, uh, and it's and, and it's worked well to, to ensure that uh, we've really thought about what happens in a literacy block to the extent that we know how long it exists for. Uh, but we also have done some uh, definition of like what specifically should happen uh, within that literacy block. Um, and 
Uh, last year, we did a lot of work on like what can happen in small group literacy blocks so that we can do that targeted instruction in the classroom um, rather than um, a pullout model. So, so how do we empower uh, and uh, support teachers so that they feel comfortable at both layer one and layer two um, so that they can meet the needs of all students within the classroom? Gabe, do you want to add um, anything from your perspective? I'm not sure. I don't think, I don't, think I don't see his name. <laughs> maybe he's not on the call. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think. I, I guess uh, if I could add just a little bit more. I mean, I think sure. uh, you. Sheila, you showed the the structured literacy webpage that that that's archived and uh, like proprietary for us, and we've worked really hard uh, to make sure that um, the majority of the resources are there, um, so that teachers um, can can use them with facility and don't have to create their own resources. And we've uh, we've used a lot of um, title funds as well as some release time uh, to make sure that that's it's it's a user friendly source for teachers um, so that they don't have to invent things um, so that they don't have to create um, word lists they can just seek uh, the word lists from that resource that's already aligned um, and make sure that the word lists align to uh, the phonemes that we're working on for example so um, it's a pretty broad resource. Uh, it's a pretty great resource. Um, and all the teachers that we brought on the last couple of years to do this have been amazed by its uh, both facility of use as well as breadth of use uh, to, to make sure we're meeting all kids' needs. And I'll say like the one significant change in my time as a principal here is when a kid goes from a pullout service, should they have a pullout service as part of an IEP and they or, or or for any other reason, they come back into the room. There's the, there's a ubiquity of language that exists and a consistency of language, so that they um, so that everyone understands kind of the same lexicon, um, which did not exist before when we used more of a patchwork approach. And I think to piggyback that, Matt, it's across the district, which is great. You can go to either elementary school, you can go to the middle school, and the language is still the same for folks, as, or for, especially for students as they cross between schools and grade levels. On behalf of uh, our participants, I just want to say thank you so much for that. It was a really rich presentation and a terrific window into the systemic approach that you've taken and the ways that you have uh, dug in for the long haul. So kudos. Um, my name is Lori Quinn. I'm the uh, Stern Center president and also a member of the Vermont Reading League. And I am uh, here to facilitate questions that folks have um, for our presenters today. There's one here I'd like to share. What are your thoughts about training teachers to increase their knowledge of the foundations of English, such as training in letters, versus training teachers in specific programs? So general knowledge versus specific programs. Thoughts on that from anybody? So that's why we went with um, the Orton-Gillingham approach because it teaches teachers the foundations of how reading and literacy is taught and it's not a program. Um, the teachers have to gain very detailed specific skills in how to be a teacher of reading. Um, that's why we didn't go with a program approach because before we were using foundations um, not implemented well, we were using foundations, that was the K-2 curriculum, um, and it wasn't being implemented with fidelity, and folks didn't really know what it meant. They didn't know what a phoneme really was, or what is a diagraph, what are the six-syllable types. Um, so by going through the structured literacy training, or the OG approach to teaching literacy in the general education classroom, they became teachers of literacy. Um, so then you don't need a program. You can actually use the approach to build your lessons on a daily basis. Thank you, Kara. That's helpful to a uh, second question here, which is what is being used after f &P was stopped? Wondering what is out there. So um, I, I think you've answered that in part by saying it's really using the Orton-Gillingham approach rather than a specific program. But um, perhaps you could speak to what's happening in um, classrooms in terms of foundations now or other um, other curricula. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that's why that website and those banks of resources are so critically important, because that has become essentially the curriculum, right? That's the place where we go to. That's where all of the resources are shared. Um, we've also reached recently purchased Fish Tank. And I don't know, Matt, if you can offer anything um, specific about Fish Tank, um, but that's another resource that we'll be using um, going forward. We piloted that last year and we'll be moving that into full implementation this year. Yeah, so I can just add a little bit. Um, so um, the we, we do use the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year uh, uh, OG uh, assessment um, that we uh, implemented either last year or the year before. Um, I think it was the year before because we realized that that data was too, uh, too spread out. So uh, this past year, we had all of our instructor, all of our teachers uh, work on an unsupported um, spelling assessment based on like the spelling pattern that they were working on at that point in time called an SOS. And so we've worked on systems to like archive that data and understand um, how to make uh, instructional um, corrections or adjustments based on um, that student data on a weekly basis, um, or at least on a, a, a more frequent basis by weekly. Um, relatedly, um, one of the pieces of feedback from our teachers was that um, uh, we needed a little bit more um, comprehension use. So we we use Fish Tank as an online resource, um, and we piloted two units last year, and we're uh, pushing more just to have a, a, a more comprehensive um, reading comprehension and writing uh, component to it. Uh, and that's all been teacher decisions around like what units those are, how they pair in with um, some of the other subjects. I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, Fish Tank, but it's 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 largely um, aligned with uh, a lot of the work that you might do in science and social studies as well. And really making sure that um, we're careful uh, not to overload teachers' plates and make sure that there's some dovetailing between um, writing, uh, reading comprehension, and and some of those other those other subjects because there's a finite amount of time in the day, especially when you implement with fidelity the 90 minute literacy block and the 75 minute math block. So. That's really helpful, Matt, in terms of a question we had about uh, district level assessments um, and and building on that, um, looking for more about the specific assessments you're using. You gave us a pretty nice overview there. Is there anything else you would add anybody um, about assessments uh, that have helped you in this process? I mean, we continue to have national screeners because these are uh, relatively locally developed. So we still use uh, FAST, uh, different elements of the FAST kind of suite. Um, and we like to compare those and find out how they're doing. As Sheila alluded to with the like VT cap, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the instructional approach uh, of uh, OG and necessarily what's on that, which is where we identified things like fish tank as we need to do more reading comp as a function of that to ensure that we're, we have a, a robust approach um, and we've included some additional read alouds um, to make sure that um, teachers have time in their schedule apart from that 90 minutes to do that. And we've kind of folded in um, some anti-bias, anti-racist work into that and have teachers that work on that to select those um, um, to make sure that our uh, the materials in our classroom are reflective of the, the kind of community we want to um, support. That's great. Thank you. Another question from a participant, is the district getting support for this effort from Title II? Um, we are. We're using our Title II funds to help pay for some of the professional development. Um, again, if teachers are taking this for credit, they don't we don't use Title II for that. We use uh, they use their professional development funds. But yes, we are able to use our our title funds for that and for some of the resource um for getting some of the resources as well. Um, so yeah, we are we are using our grant funds. I wish Gabe was on the call because he could tell more specifically and strategically um, how he's able to do that. Um, and certainly if anyone has specific questions, they can follow up and we'll be happy to to um, share our strategies with you. Appreciate our that. Grant strategies. <laughs> That's great. 
Um, question for you, Sheila, about the goals that you mentioned uh, as mm -hmm. part of principal um, goal setting. What were a couple of the most powerful and relevant goals that your principal set um, as you moved the literacy work forward together? Yeah, um, one of the great things about working in Vermont is that, like, I see so many familiar faces on this call. I think that was a Chris Dodge question, and Chris and I had the benefit of working together, so I miss you, Chris. <laughs> um, one of the things we, I really encouraged the principals to do was to get really specific with those goals, and um, an example of, of uh, a really powerful goal was in looking at, you know, sort of our data. We wanted to be really um, have our goals really steeped in data. Um, a goal that Matt, I think, worked on was specific to second grade um, and specific to small group instruction. So the theory of action was that with more targeted small group instruction, um, we would see, you know, change over time um, in that data, which was, um, you know, a little bit lower than what we were seeing um, in some of the other data. And through walkthroughs, which we do regularly as an administrative team, um, it was observed that the small group work that was happening may not have been targeted, right? It was happening, but what was the assessment data that was supporting that particular small group instruction on that particular day? So, so you know, it's kind of trying to be a little bit more purposeful around group work. That one really stands out to me um, as being as being the kind of goal we're looking for when we think about um, principal goals. I don't know, Matt, if you want to add anything, what was your goal? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the the development of goals helps you do like two things that as administrators to make sure that you're giving the sufficient time to meet with the teachers to talk about data um, and ensure that they have the data to talk about. So it's, it's a mutually beneficial goal that ultimately benefits students. Um, and so that that's, in my mind, why it's super valuable in identifying like where we might uh, find problems of practice uh, based on our like uh, big data and by big data I just mean like our school-wide data and then drilling down into it uh, to understand and and I think uh, being clear with the other participants within your goal because I had those conversations like this is why I this is why this is one of my professional goals uh, helps them understand that I see a, a potential issue that we can all work on together and I can support them um, in supporting me be a more effective um, leader in literacy. Mm -hmm. Terrific thanks Matt. A uh, question about the coaching. Um, can you speak more about the work of your coaches both internal and external coaches? How do they work with teachers? And what have you seen as a result of that work? How did you build a coaching culture in your schools? So lots of layers there. Any way you want to get into it is great with us. I mean, I could, I certainly regularly over the last several years, Peggy um, Price has been coming to our schools and providing that level of coaching and support for teachers through training, through uh, walkthroughs through instructional support and through leadership support. So there's that level of coaching. And then there's the day to day coaching. We have a position. We have a coach at the elementary level to share, you know, across the district, which we're not a huge district. We have you know, 840 students um, across three campuses. Um, I think one of the um, Areas where we're working to improve that culture of coaching is through, you know, that access to the coach. It's been slightly um, sort of more optional, like I'm over here, let me know if you need anything versus really purposeful and um, direct. And so I think that um, Matt in particular has worked to overcome that through building more team time and more grade level team time where the expectation is you are meeting with the coach and the coach is there and then seen as an approach, you know, seen as a support and not as a sort of pseudo administrator, which is challenging, right? Um, so I'd say that that notion is a little bit of a barrier, right? That the coach is somehow going to be the informant um, to tell the principal of things that aren't happening, and that's not the case, right? Our coaches are are there. Our coach is there to you know to be a support, to to listen to the teacher, and then therefore develop those resources. And I think that that's been huge too, um, because the the resource development. Um, 
you know, is, is, was an expressed need and then therefore met by the coach. So that builds that, you know, trust and, and, um, collegiality around this being a team effort. So, um, again, Matt, I don't know what you want to add. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think just, uh, the, the expectation around the practicum um, and the work that teachers do around the practicum has built a lot of capacity within our staff, within our teaching staff, to have a deeper understanding of like what an effective literacy uh, lesson looks like, because it, it uh, you know, Sheila alluded to us hiring 65% of our staff. There aren't a lot of good um, teacher training programs that are doing a, a, a banger job with this. So we feel income, we feel responsibility to to do that so that our teacher or that our students have the advantage. And it really builds kind of collegiality among the grade level teachers who are doing it concurrently. Um, and there is um, that expectation that we have a literacy meeting periodically and that uh, and that is an addition to like an MTSS meeting. Um, so there's a, a, a universal understanding that we're taking data regularly. We're using the data at the classroom level uh, and at the school level to um, make sure that our, our kids are getting what they need to be successful. Thank you. I have a question here that I think is a, a fairly broad one. So I'm going to read you the, um, the scenario and see how you'd like to approach it. Um, the question is, how would one approach a system that's in a patchwork approach currently, I presume, um, utilizing reading interventionists as special ed instructors and inclusion because all funds are bunched together and materials are varied and scattered throughout the district? Um, I'll stop there. There's more to the question, um, which you're welcome to read, but just to give you a sense of, you know, in that fragmented environment that's being described, what advice would you have for setting a direction and beginning the change process? Yeah, I mean, I think that that probably describes a lot of systems because we never just start on day one. We're always in transition from something to something, right? But I'd say... Um, from my vantage point, your administrative team developing a theory of action for the work in general would be a really good starting spot. What are you trying to do and what specifically um, does that look like? What, what resources are in support of that goal, you know, that vision? Um, what what resources are possibly not serving that vision or that goal? And, you know, how do you get more cohesive around what you do have, um, even if it's limited? Um, and that could help you just be a little bit more efficient and purposeful with the strategies. And that would be, I think, a good first step. And I think this could also speak to sort of Kara and her team, you know, sort of initially to say, like, how are we going to get started on this? And and to a certain extent, um, they drew a line in the sand and stepped over it. Right. So to speak, like despite where we've been, boom, this is where we're going and we're going to start with this seminal you know, foundational learning experience for everyone and then build from there. So that's, you know, another approach. Kara, anything you want to add there? Yeah, I mean, that's essentially like when, when you read the um, scenario, I was like, oh, that was us in 2018. <laughs> like, um, but, you know, like Sheila said, we worked as a team and we said, OK, what can we do? What two or three things each year are we going to do to move this along? What's our end goal? We, I mean, kind of knew what our end goal wanted to be. We want all, all kids to read, um, to be leaving fourth grade reading at grade level. Like that's our ultimate goal. Um, but how do we get there? Um, so, you know, using a universal design, backing it up, the theory of action, um, and just starting and, and taking it little bite size at a time. I mean, I would love to change the whole world at once, but it's not going to happen. Um, so what little, little bites can we do each year to move in the right direction for all our students? Great. Thank you. Question about optimizing teaching time and minimizing the time used on assessments. How have you done that? Um, I think largely by setting the expectation for the 90 minute uninterrupted literacy block, right? Like, and, um, 
and the 75 minute math block. Um, those are two pretty big shifts and there's some pain points there, right? It means teachers have to give up um, in some cases, you know, practices that they very much enjoy, but they that might not be in service of those goals and that vision. Um, and so that's easy for me to say, you know, over here in central office, just do it. I think the lived experience of what that, that looks like on the day in and day out is, is something Matt could speak more to. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, when we, when we articulated the why about why these shifts were happening, it was, it was pretty easy for teachers to see, you know, it was, it was pretty well known, for example, that like we had no consistent spelling program when I started here. So we would, you know, I was pretty consistent when saying like, we can't spend the first four weeks teaching which spelling program we're going to do because they're all different. They're not good or bad. They're just all different. So we're losing, you know, four weeks four weeks of instruction to teach students how the spelling program works. So, so being really clear with the, the why with teachers was, was pretty helpful and helping them understand that like there is some loss um, of instruction. Um, I think, you know, one of, uh, I think that Andy Capas, who was the principal at Ferrisburg kind of at the uh, beginning of this talks about like the Grecian urn and, and giving up that project that kids all love, kids all remember, and frankly doesn't necessarily lead to changing any outcomes. So being pretty deliberate with our conversations with, with teachers about like why we're doing the things we're doing and it's not just arbitrary um, has been has been helpful. And I guess I'm going to answer the next question because I'm reading the chat too about uh, not too much testing. I mean, I think we use the, S we're doing the SOS anyway like uh the uh the sorry my camera's been off most of the time um so uh we do the sos anyway so we didn't want to do we wanted more regular data with students but we didn't want teachers to have to take more regular data so we just uh like a, additional data we just wanted to assess what they were actually doing and so um that's just data that they're taking anyway we're just using it more practically to make sure that the the students are learning the targets and we've worked toward like what is a mastery level of understanding at the classroom level so that teachers aren't moving on just because you've taken the assessment and we've worked with teacher teams to make sure that like if you're really not at 80 percent um, at the classroom level um, you really can't move on and giving that permission because there is you know there's a breadth of uh, regardless of what uh, your curricular expectations are you're probably not going to accomplish them in seven 175 days or whatever your your calendar is so making sure that we have an expectation that that students are learning and demonstrating their learning prior to moving on and that permission and regular conversation around it shouldn't just happen at the end of the trimester or semester it should be ongoing between the administrative team whatever your structure is and and the, the teacher teams uh, because we don't want to just move kids to third grade um, that that still can't spell at the first grade level because they took a whole bunch of spelling quizzes. I appreciate that, Matt. And I think it does speak to the um, the second part of the question, which really springs off of the national and, and state test result data that you shared, uh, Sheila, candidly saying, we're not seeing huge gains yet. We, we, we know that this is broader than the Orton-Gillingham approach and the foundations that you're seeking to build that Matt speaks to. Um, this question also asks about what you're doing in the areas of vocabulary, morphology, and reading, writing of rigorous texts, the other sort of components. And so wanted to give you all a chance to speak to that piece. I think we're building, we're starting to expand on those other pieces. I think in the beginning, just transitioning to this OG approach was a very heavy lift and really sort of giving teachers the time to focus on that was important because if you try to do everything all at once, nothing's going to get done very well. So in bringing on fish tank and in bringing on some of those other pieces, we're now getting more de deliberate around um, those other elements. Um, I think specific to the data and, and um, you know, the disconnect between the structured literacy approach 
very specifically Orton Gillingham based lessons. And then that later sort of ET cap, mostly comprehension based, um, you know, assessment, um, you know, we're teaching the skills right now. And there's that new learning that comes with the skills. And I think that the SOS data and the other things that Matt spoke about are good measures for those things. And that we're really going to need to start focusing on the transfer of that to application to comprehension and other things. Um, over time to start to see that the needle moves, I guess, on that on that state level data as well. And I, I believe strongly that it will. And um, I think the beautiful thing about that is that the foundation will be very solid and not uh, not shaky with with lots and lots of holes. Right. Students are going to come into being able to build on this um, platform that's that's just very strong and stable. So I'm very hopeful um, that we will see change over time on those other scores. Yeah, I'm struck by the, um, I think it's courageous to be willing to say we're building a foundation, we're playing the long game. Um, education is, is full of impatience for the quick fix, but we didn't get into this place of literacy levels quickly. Um, and I think it, it serves us all to remember that. I would also note that the, the, Orton, -Gilling the Orton Gillingham approach certainly does not neglect vocabulary, writing, morphology, these things are all part of the approach. Um, and just because we are partners uh, in this work, I know that your professional learning for teachers has also included all of that in the, in the mm -hmm. scope and sequence work. There's a question here about um, the literacy resources and the um, tremendous trove of um, resources that you built for the district. I, my understanding is that that's an in-district uh, resource. Am I am I correct in that? And so the question it is, it is an in-district resource. It's something that's you know kind of personal to our teachers and and our coaches and the work they do together. So it's very specific to our district and our work. So um, it's not something we would necessarily publish, you know, for others use, but we'd be happy to share sort of pieces and parts of it as a representation or a model from which to build your own work. And I think that that's a really important piece. I think when you build something together, it represents a lot of shared learning and that there's value in going through that process together with your teacher teams. Um, but we'd be happy to share sort of the framework for it. So you have some idea of, of what it includes. That's great. Can anybody think of a um, uh, of an insight that came up as you were actually doing that building work together? I think your point's well made that the process itself can um, result in some new aha moments about how things are going or where there might be gaps. Um, does anything come to mind for any of y'all about how that um, resource came together and what you learned from building it? Um, well, one of the things I remember hearing over and over was there um, folks wanted to see each other teach lessons and the schedule doesn't always allow that. So one of the literacy coaches, well, what, what about if we make, I think Peggy actually suggested this too. What about if we do video libraries of our own teachers modeling exemplar lessons and they could watch each other this way and grow. Um, and that has been huge. I know many new teachers that have come on that maybe don't start their OG training until October when the course starts, but that's a month into school. How do I get ready? they're watching the video resources that are on our site and they're able to kind of get up to par to like at least get going until they get into their coursework, which is a great resource. Yeah, love that as an aha moment, right? Oh, we could show each other our stuff. Yeah, in, in, in using a little technology help. I, I can imagine also incredibly helpful to brand new teachers, right? That just that, that, that um, initial ramp up um, being able to observe colleagues in action, doing good work. That's cool. Other questions from our participant group are welcome if you have them or other comments that our presenters would like to make about areas we maybe haven't touched on yet in your experience. I guess I would just underscore the comment that you also just made, Lori, in that like you've got to be patient, right? You, you said it takes, you know, it takes courage to sort of suspend that expectation that, you know, this is going to lead to something very concrete on your state level scores. Um, 
I think what we're doing is the right thing to do for students. And I think, like I said, that over time that's going to show up, but there is kind of impatience, I think, uh, all around. Like people are like, oh, reading again, you, you know, what, what, when, when are we going to hear, when are we going to focus on math or when are we going to hear more about, you know, and it's not like we're not doing those things, um, but this remains our top priority. And I think rightfully so. And um, yeah. And that's just an important thing for us to continually share, you know, whether it's the board or for our staff, you know, sort of saying this again, <laughs> which, you know, they don't, but, um, but, um, but that could be a perception um, that, that others may have. And so just to kind of be prepared for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and here's a, I think a thoughtful uh, question that's related Um do you see an impact on students' attitudes toward reading or toward school generally, right, in terms of that affective dimension? How's that part been going? Matt, I don't know if you want to speak from the student perspective. I'd say for our students now, it's all they've ever had. So it's not like a before and an after. Um, but, but Matt, I don't know. Do you see um, students it's hard. differently it's, now? It's, it's uh I guess I guess it's hard to draw a straight line from one to the other because it's not the only thing that we have cooking. Uh, we transitioned like a smaller elementary school here at the same time and had COVID um, for a couple of years. Uh, so yeah, just a few uh, factors happening, right? right. So it's I, I mean I think uh, kids uh, understand what's expected in class. Do you know what I mean? So from a certain level of understanding they know what's going to happen next year they know that their teachers talk to each other um and although they're in third grade they not they might not be jumping right to and they don't necessarily know this like the third grade scope and sequence because maybe they have um a couple um lessons to complete from the second grade scope and sequence so it's really created a lot of conversation i think it's facilitated a lot of um understanding by kids i will say like we systemically in this building anyway are going to move toward like structured literacy because OG is is part of literacy, but it's not everything um, in, in a general sense. So we're just trying to use that language with with kids and families from here on out. Um, uh, but I, I don't I don't know. I mean, there are some kids who struggle with handwriting uh, who would struggle with handwriting regardless of what we we're doing. So uh, I don't know. I don't know that they're uh like Sheila said they don't know any different and I guess from my perspective like I'm hopeful that we start to see those gains on the state level testing because the kids have always had it um and they'll be uh you know our third fourth and fifth graders will have had um a more robust experience it's interesting like thinking about the morphology question from easier or from earlier because it might not manifest until they get to you know high school level science classes where their teachers are like, I don't know why those kids get this vocabulary when it's all, you know, um, Latin and Greek roots. Uh, but it, that might be where it shows up, but it's not necessarily going to show up on a, on a VT cap for uh, ELA in 10th grade or ninth, whenever I've been out of high school for a while. So, yeah. <laughs> right. You've been out of high school for a while, perhaps, but not so long that you don't remember what it looks like when that knowledge isn't there. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Well, um, this is a good time to say a big thank you to our presenters. Um, Brenda, is there anything that you would like to add as our uh, Vermont Reading League president before we sign off? Um, no, I'd just like to, like, again, uh, thank uh, Dr. Sewell and um, and our prior two pre uh, presenters also for giving us such great information. I also want to apologize to Dr. Sewell for miss uh, uh, calling you by the wrong last name. Um, I I don't know what happened there. So anyway, I apologize for that. No worries. No worries. Don't worry. Don't worry about no that. Worries. And I hope that um, everyone has a good rest of your summer. And again, if you missed the prior uh, presentations, please be sure to check the recordings and those should be available sometime in the next uh, week or two. Thank you, everybody. Wishing you a great rest of your day.